I'm sorry about the wind, but we're gonna make do with what we can because I want to shoot this video about the small and large intestines. Today is episode 29, and welcome to the What Comes to Mind series. So, in our last video, in episode 28, we talked about the stomach and how it's kind of like our food mixer to break down mechanically and biologically via enzymes, via the stomach acid, to produce something called chyme, which is partially digested food and grassic juices. So, we've got this kind of goopiness. Now, we've got taken in the food from our mouth, been processed in our stomach. And remember, our mouth does a bit about biting into the food, or our saliva does something, goes to our stomach, and does what I've just mentioned. Then what happens? What actually happens to that goopy, looks like baby food to be fair? What does our body do next? Do next? It's the small intestines. I just saw an apple. And there's another apple. I do like apples. I just realized there's a lot of apples. Oh. We got another apple. We got another apple, another apple, another apple. Imagine there was like a roadway of apples. I should get back to the video already. So firstly, that goopy juice-like food enters the small intestine. And the main function of the small intestine is to basically absorb everything into our bloodstream so we can make use of it. It's already been broken down into the kind of components that our body can make use of in the stomach. So now it's about getting it into our actual body. So water, electrolytes, nutrients is where essentially all of that business happens in the sense of the small intestine. Now you probably remember from school, if I'm not mistaken, something known as villi. You see the picture now, and that essentially is where the actual absorption happens. That lining, we have tons and tons of these villi. You see it like a microfiber cloth. Um, I'll show a picture of that now. And essentially that's what happens, or that's what it looks like in the small intestines. And that's how actually we absorb all the things that we need to absorb. So essentially once all that absorption occurs, what happens next? What does a large intestine actually do? So, essentially, by the time the remaining contents have entered the large intestine through a particular valve I'm going to be talking about later, a lot of it is indigestible. So, a lot of fermentation to where the bacteria in our colon start to ferment with the indigestible food to produce some vitamins, known as vitamin K, vitamin B, biotin. So we can extract uh, those nutrients from the indigestible material. However, also, by the time the food has also entered the large intestine, 90% of the water has already been absorbed in the small intestine. So the remaining 10% is where essentially the large intestine starts to focus on. Because the reason why that is essentially so important is once that remaining percentage of water is removed as much as possible, it starts to solidify and condense to form what we know as feces, which are then kind of stored in the rectum to then be disposed of. So you imagine all the food that you eat in front of the mouse, broken down, saliva helps to break it down in terms of enzymes, something I talked about in the stomach video, which you can see here. Stomach breaks it down mechanically as well. The stomach acid also helps. Then gets into the small intestine where it gets really absorbed. Then essentially you can think of, can you hear the wind? Let me move a bit forward. Hopefully that's a bit better. You go into the large intestine where it's essentially solidified and condensed more so the remaining waste that's left can be excreted. That's a bit of a kind of a whistle stop to a crash course into essentially the digestive system. But something else I forgot to mention in terms of the small intestine. Before I go or before I start I can either talk about the anatomy the three little small words or you can look at this. Well, as much as I like talking about what I talk about, you have to stop and look at nature too. I'm hoping I can share that with you through a little montage you just saw. But back to that little bit of small intestine that I didn't talk about. It has three basic parts. You can see three basic sections of the small intestine. So the entry part, so where it comes from the stomach, is known as the duodenum. You can see it here, the name. 
And then essentially the middle part, like the, the business part of the small intestine is known as the jejunum, as you can see here. Some quite interesting names, isn't it? But then the latter part, which is what I want to focus on in this part of the video, is the ileum, you can see here. And the reason why I want to focus on this part of the small intestine is that valve I mentioned earlier between the small intestine and the large intestine is incredibly crucial to a lot of the disorders and a lot of the regulation between the intestines in general. And that valve is known as the ileocecal valve. Ileocecal valve. I said it twice to help me to pronounce it as well because sometimes some medical terminology is not easy for us to even pronounce. So what is this valve? Now this valve is incredibly important but also very similar to another essential valve I talked about another sphincter muscle so this valve is also known as a sphincter muscle something we can't control and it allows things to open and close in the last video I talked about a sphincter muscle can you remember what it is? let me know in the comments if you can or you can just wait for me to tell you it's entirely up to you but in case you didn't know or you didn't remember or if you haven't watched the video you need to watch the video gotta watch it first that sphincter muscle is actually known as the lower eosophageal sphincter and it has a very similar process to this valve i want to talk about so this ileocecal valve controls the material from that finishes from the small intestine and goes into the large intestine for the processes that we just talked about the lower eosophageal sphincter valve controls what happens between the esophagus and the stomach and we talked about what happens when that valve is compromised or is not functioning properly so there's some malfunction and unfortunately stomach acid shoots back up into the esophagus that similar nearly identical principle applies to this valve here because if it's shut too much it can cause constipation if it's left open too long it can cause diarrhea and we know a lot of those symptoms are related to certain gastrointestinal disorders. To give you another idea of why this is so crucial, imagine if that valve was left open, a lot of the contents that's being fermented or being produced um, in the large intestine can actually fall back into the small intestine. There can be a backlog. It can actually, it should be closed, but it's falling back into the small intestine. And then some of that content that shouldn't be absorbed starts to get absorbed by the small intestine. If any of you have a waterfall near where you live, please let me know because I look at this, which I'm about to show you, as incredible. And I'm sure you have even bigger waterfalls and fountains uh, to look at. So let me just show you this one. So back to where I was about the valve. To give you an idea of what happens really when it is shot too much, Imagine there's a buildup of actual pressure in the small intestine. It should be going into the lower, uh, large intestines, but there's a blockage, it's shut. So that buildup of pressure builds up of gas, or blockages of food, and then that gas has to go somewhere. You get that bloating feeling, you get that constipation feeling, but that gas has to go, that buildup of gas has to go somewhere. So it goes back up the, the, the digestive system. So you get that belching feeling, that burping sensations, and that's essentially because of that valve being shut too much. Right, let's move on. So now we mentioned about the importance of this particular valve and essentially how it plays such a crucial role in how the intestines actually function. But there's something else that's even more important for the whole digestive system as a whole. And that is actually microbes. Microorganisms, microbiome, microbiota, bacteria. Whichever name you want to use or you prefer, essentially what I'm talking about is good bacteria that is in our gut, in our small intestines and in our large intestines. And sometimes it's scary to think, wow, there's microbes in our gut. And um, you hear a lot about prebiotics, about gut flora. That's another term we can use. But essentially, they are actually there to help us, to actually help us. And here's one of the reasons how. Let's take the large intestines for example. A lot of the material that ends up there is indigestible. We can't actually process it. But the bacteria there that actually ferments onto the food to produce certain fatty acids and gases that our body actually makes use of. And even the other bacteria make use of. So 
that's something we can't do with the, with the bacteria, the microbes do it for us. Think about it in terms of infections. When you have a bacterial infection, some of the bacteria there help to fight off or minimize the symptoms coming from the harmful bacteria that we take in. So the more diverse we have, in simple terms, the better chance we have at fighting off certain infections. So you want to look at it as a mutually beneficial relationship between humans and the microbes, because us as humans, we provide food for the microbes to survive and thrive on. And in return, the microbes ferment and produce gases and certain molecules that we actually benefit and make use of, that we couldn't do ourselves. So that's why those microbes are not just there sitting and feeding off us, they provide a lot of benefit. And there's a whole host of articles I'm going to put in the description box about connections to the brain, the immune system, because I could talk a lot about that and I want to in another series. But I just want to shed light on the sheer importance these gut micro microbes actually have to our entire body. But what happens when you have dysbiosis, and that basically means microbial imbalance, you have inflammation, you've got stress and a poor diet. What effect does that have on the intestines? Let's talk about that now. A common term that you probably heard in regards to what I've just mentioned about the gut having a dysbiosis, inflammation, diet, stress is IBS, Irritable Bowel Syndrome or Irritable Bowel Disorders. And I want to talk about why this is prevalent and how certain conditions are even worse than this. So essentially IBS can occur for many forms and many reasons but when you have that essentially that bloating feeling, that stomach cramp, that abdominal pain, whether it's constipation or diarrhea, that is all linked or under the umbrella of irritable bowel syndrome. And something that is not pleasant to deal with. It can be chronic, um, it's an inflammatory condition as well. So, you know, all sorts of medication might be required, therapy might be required. But I really wanted to focus today's episode on two types of diseases under the bracket of irritable bowel disorders. One is Crohn's disease, second is ulcerative colitis, or UC. So let's start off with Crohn's disease. Now, technically it's classified as an inflammatory gastrointestinal disorder that can affect anywhere from the mouth all the way down to the anus in terms of the digestive system. But it can also affect the eyes, the skin, the joints. A lot of scarring and swelling that occurs in the small intestines can have a profound effect on the rest of the body. Now, certain therapies, um, steroids might be needed, to lower the immune system because it's actually sometimes it's the immune system itself that's causing the problem. And you heard me mention in episode five, if I can remember, is the inflammation video about how crucial the inflammatory process is and when it's imbalanced, the profound effects it has on the body. Crohn's disease is essentially the immune system attacking the gastrointestinal tract to cause all of these problems that we occur. And it's actually very similar to ulcerative colitis because you see me. Did you get it? Like the you see me. I shouldn't really do jokes because that was a bad one, wasn't it? But you see in terms of ulcerative colitis or ulcerative colitis, it's very similar to Crohn's disease as I mentioned, but it's mostly focused in the large intestine, in the bowel. So a similar type of inflammatory process is attacking a part of the system, it's causing the problems such as loose stool, urgency for bowel movement, diarrhea, constipation, you know, feeling weak and fatigue, uh, a lot of weight loss because of the inability to eat and process the food properly. But whereas Crohn's disease can span essentially the rest of the body, ulcerative colitis essentially focuses on the large bowel, but has a profound and devastating effect. I've seen firsthand patients and clinical cases that colleagues have told me about, about how devastating UC can be in terms of the multiple surgeries that are required, the mesh and the metal that goes into the digestive system to try and mitigate temporary situations. And it's a condition that maybe none of you have probably heard of, but it's something that requires a lot of surgery, requires a lot of therapy, requires a lot of maintenance. And many disorders have their you know, paramount importance in terms of treatment. But you know, not being able to eat properly and process the food, how many times do we enjoy something that's in our cupboard, in our fridge, and not even for one second think of the repercussions it might have on our body. We take it in. Sometimes we go to a restaurant, we know we're not going to feel well, but we still like the food. Imagine when you have to go to hospital because of it, where 
you have to actually eat or drink through certain juices and, and food boxes like having a baby food when you're an adult and these clinical cases are staggering to think that when the gastrointestinal system is affected is compromised is start feeding imagine that bloating food poisoning feeling constantly all the time and it scares me and you know i wish those who unfortunately are going through this find treatments uh, soon find therapies that can help them and surgeries go successfully because gastrointestinal system is sometimes an underrated part of the human body we take it for granted we bombard ourselves with food not think about the potential terms even colon cancer type levels later on so to finish off with the whole notion of what comes to mind um, two things literally come up into my head and one is in the small intestine is where that essential crosswalk that cross path is where what we take in actually goes into our body now when we take in food we say it goes into our body but it doesn't go into our bloodstream yet you know once it goes into the stomach it's essentially where most of the absorption of nutrients water electrolytes, as i mentioned comes into our, our actual body so when we process it here in our stomach it's still connected to the outside world in terms of um, the air pollution the air outside but when our small intestines grab it, make use of it, take it in, that's actually where we take in things, which is essentially pretty cool. But the other one is the hidden nature, the hidden world that happens in the small intestine and large intestine. Going from solid food to partially digested in the stomach to then being absorbed and then condensed and solidified into feces to be stored in the rectum and then excreted. That's all happening right now without us knowing and I find that fascinating to think of all of those processes, all of those bacteria, all of those contractions, all of those absorptions happening just like that all the time and I find that truly astonishing just like I find the human body truly remarkable. So that's it for today I hope you enjoyed and benefited from the information I talked about in terms of the small intestine, the large intestine, the microbes the special valve that has a huge importance in certain disorders that we face and you got to see a bit of nature with a little bit of rain i apologize if the wind was was a bit difficult at times i shall try my best um, in the next video because the next video is going to be the finale of season one i first set out to make 30 videos in a series to benefit you guys and it's been 29 videos so far and in the finale i'm going to be talking about what i've learned the good the bad little bit of bloopers um, what's going to be next in terms of um, seasons and the next kind of style of videos and essentially give you an insight as to something I'm trying to develop to show you how I did all of this uh, so stay tuned for that it's going to come around um, uh, towards the end of this week and if you haven't subscribed please do so please help me out please help the foundation out um, because then you can stay tuned for epic videos um, so I shall see you in the finale take care